Defining moments and discovering purpose is what SEDEX is all about. Tune in to hear today's leaders and thought influencers as they share their stories, connecting their journey to their actions and bringing their life's lessons to you. Let's get started with our host, Doug Sandler. Ernie Vecchio is a mentor, spiritual teacher, and trauma psychologist. During his 30 plus years, he has treated over 10,000 patients who have suffered severe trauma that range from amputation, head injury, sexual assault, and paralysis. Ernie is a licensed clinical and rehabilitation psychologist who has written four books, including his latest release, Feelings and Reason, Activating Your Heart as Compass Despite the Ego's Interference, an international bestseller in four self-help categories. Ernie, sharing your story and your inspiration or what SEDEX is all about, please share your mission and your story starting right now. Thank you, Doug, for having me. Let me begin first by giving your audience some backstory on myself. I was originally a child of the state, like alcoholism, domestic violence, abuse, and abandonment were all my experience before the age of five. And because of these conditions, I kind of bore the mark of shame, if you will, for most of my young adult life four years of placements and more abuse, I eventually landed in a Presbyterian home for children by age nine. The next five years, which many people would consider hell, was simply me learning to fend for myself and survive. It was not until age 14 that my life finally began to settle. And when this happened, I quickly became a champion or a big brother, if you will, for everybody in the children's home and my local high school who felt like an outsider. Unbeknownst to myself, this was laying the foundation for me to become a professional help. Years later, I naively enter a profession, psychology, where if you didn't have a problem when you come in, you certainly had one when you left. This bothered me because I was not a big fan of mental health labels. Besides the stigma, they can add salt to the wound for people already in pain. They can also oppress people and confuse their identity. Early on in my career, this reality made me hesitant to diagnose my patients. I learned that most people just wanted someone, really anybody, to be able to see them. Even today, this is still the number one complaint that many people have about the medical community, this whole idea of being seen. Fortunately, as life would have it, my career path led me to become the head psychologist in a trauma hospital. I say fortunately because it gave me the sacred opportunity to see the inner workings of everyday people undergoing extreme and traumatic experiences. Amputees and people with head injuries, paralysis, and acquired blindness, these were the norm for my daily practice. Needless to say, it made my hard beginnings or difficult beginnings seem insignificant by comparison. My abuse and emotional trauma didn't affect me in the same way. By that, I mean that every patient that I saw in the hospital was having an existential crisis, wondering what their life meant. Their hearts were cracked wide open, and they wanted answers to some of life's biggest questions. At the time, talking to them about their potential or the future was problematic because, in their words, the soul and spirit of who they were had been emptied onto the floor by trauma. It became very clear that my profession barely spoke to the spiritual dimension my patients were revealing to me. In the end, I learned that the soul and spirit of anyone is really all there is of them. If my patients were to recover, I had to better understand their internal lives along their psychological adjustment. Born out of this realization was the fact that human beings have incredible navigational abilities that are specifically amplified during crisis. Now fast forward to the present, Doug. We cannot see the whole of our lives through the lens of an unconscious or shame-filled ego. However, awakened by adversity, this same ego can shift from a moral two-dimensional view of life to a larger perspective. In other words, when people can see the big picture, they also see meaning in their life story that wasn't there before. This is a big deal. Part of the inspiration for my book, Feelings and Reason, was the observation that since 1980, we have three generations of people struggling with a wound of shame, where guilt says, I made a mistake, shame says, I am a mistake. You can see that shame is without a doubt a wound to the soul of who someone is. The result has been an increase in mental health problems, but also an increase in personality problems in general. If you didn't know, the fix for the ego 
when it's riddled with shame is narcissism, an exaggerated sense of self that's built on a false foundation. Insurance companies have seen the increase in ego dysfunction, but because of lengthy treatment, more professionals unable to fix the problem, they're saying if everybody has it, then nobody has it. In essence, we have inadvertently installed the ego as our default compass. When it is the human heart, it has always been our inner guide. One only has to look at our culture today and see how the ego acting out has become our new normal. That said, the good news is we have a distinct philosophical view in the United States that is characterized by opposition to dogma and promotes people to be their best selves. This means that Americans are committed to finding meaning in their experiences. It is this form of pragmatism, experience as a teacher, that is symbolic of the philosophy of my book. More importantly, the experiences and the ideas that I share in its pages are not abstract, but rooted in the, in the problems and joys of people undergoing severe trauma. At its core, the philosophy is this. We come into the world as spiritual beings, but are forced to live a psychological reality. Essentially, we have a feeling, sensing, experiential self that runs in the background, observing how the fragile human ego navigates life in the foreground. In my work with people experiencing trauma, I saw this fragile ego collapse and be stripped away. This prompted my paralyzed and amputated patients to ask a profound question. If I am not this body, then what am I? Eventually, their answer was hard to put into words. All we knew is that they had tapped into something internal that was intentionally guiding and evolving them to the present during their recovery. We just had to find a language for it. But what emerged was a psycho-spiritual context for being human. This is huge because over the past several years, the mental health profession, with its orientation and centering on the brain, has made how you think is how you feel the gold standard in treating mental illness. Meanwhile, medical science is saying that what we believe we become right down to the cells of who we are. The distance between these two schools of thought is so great, it has created a void. Unfortunately, it has come at the expense of our emotional and spiritual lives. In addition, this void has produced generations of professional helpers unable to guide people through normal human despair. Combining psychology with human spirituality, I found out that, in fact, you can treat ego dysfunction while simultaneously giving station to this invisible internal world that guides so many people's lives. The problem, Doug, when we treat people as simply thinking animals, is that we fail to acknowledge and heal their traumatic histories. And at some level, everyone carries emotional wounds. In other words, where someone was before trauma determines how they will cope with adversity today. Fewer and fewer professional helpers know how to glean this information from their patients, let alone what to do with it when it comes available. How you think is how you feel leaves many people empty and ignores their deeper wounds. There's no better example of this than my two 16-year-old male patients who were above the knee amputees. One had climbed a telephone pole along an abandoned railroad track and accidentally grabbed a live electrical cable. The other had lost control of an automobile and tried to jump out of the vehicle while going over an embankment. The door closed on his legs while the car slammed sideways against a tree. One young man was spiraling into alcohol and drugs and was suicidal, and the other one was getting his GED and planning to go to college. They were both the same age, had the same disability, and presumably endured the same battle to recovery. The only thing that set these two apart was where they were before they lost their legs. Doug, if you want a real-life sensation of what this means, ask yourself this question, where was I emotionally before the pandemic, and how is that impacting my adjustment today? What you and your audience will understand and realize is that the common theme that my patients experienced, our invisible and subjective lives matter during suffering. But we only know this if we look inward. In the two cases that I just shared, the suicidal teen was carrying emotional wounds from the past that were hindering his rehabilitation. The other teen had emotional pain, but he had less psychological impairment. If they were both treated as simply having thought problems, this would have negated giving any kind of idea of their emotional maturity and their recovery would have taken twice as long. 
There's an illusion today that if our ego's thinking can be reprogrammed, then our emotional wounds will somehow evaporate or that distorted thoughts aggravate our wounds without purpose. In truth, the ego's reenactments of past thinking and emotions are intended to motivate us to self-correct and heal. Labeling this driving force as distorted thought or victim thinking reduces human beings to computers, change the program, problem solved. This could not be further from the truth. Ignoring people's inner lives has created a shared existential crisis within the culture. The spiritual beings that we were in the beginning has lost significant ground to the human ego. The only reprogramming that it needs is that it's not the human compass. While psychological interference by guilt or shame is inevitable, it's not meant to be a life sentence. When human beings are awakened by adversity, there's an internal collaboration between our intelligent observer, our feelings, our adapting ego, which then allows the heart to point the way. Once this is activated, we can be taught how to suffer. Only then can the ego rethink its role in our lives. In essence, it has to be retaught. It is only part of a larger navigational ability. Finally, Doug, I want to leave your audience with this positive and important truth. Our inner guidance remains intact and whole, no matter what you throw at it. Every time we have a moment of clarity, this is an example of how life's adversities have taught us a lesson, and it is what it feels like to be awake in one's life. This form of inner wisdom comes from the certainty that we are using the heart as our compass. Most people in the culture who say things happen for a reason understand that things happen until we get the reason. In other words, they've learned from their experience that life is and always has been a wonderful teacher. So there it is. If people want to learn more about me and my work, I can be reached at heart as compass at outlook.com or my website, ErnieHeccio.com. Thank you so much for the opportunity to become part of the SEDEX community and have a wonderful day. To get more information about SEDEX, our guest today, and to share your comments and questions, click on the show notes for important links, offers, and contact information. If you know someone that would be a good fit for SEDEX, please send us a message and share this episode on social media. Thanks again for tuning in to SEDEX.